Welcome to my video on how to find the domain of rational root functions. Now, I'm not really sure if that's like a technical name for these things, but what I'm talking about is when you have a function where the radical is in the denominator, right? a square root in the denominator or a cube root or any sort of root. <clears throat> and this is our, our most basic one. And in my previous video, we tackled functions like this, just regular rational functions, and we said these functions uh, don't have domain values where your denominator is zero. Your denominator can be anything else but zero. So in this case we had just a regular old domain restriction at zero, <clears throat> and that caused a vertical asymptote. What you'll see in these new sort of functions is that not only can the denominator not be zero, but if it's a square root, the denominator cannot be negative, which, which sort of causes a, uh, a pretty significant domain change. So when we say domain, of course, we're talking about the set of all x values that are sort of valid in the function. So the rule here is, when you have a rational function, we're just focusing on the denominator. Now in this case, the denominator not only it can't be zero, but it also can't be negative. Not possible. So we have basically a scenario where we're looking for all of the non-negative, looking for all the positive uh, values of x essentially and that would be your domain All right, so you would say the domain is it can't be zero so we're gonna leave the parenthesis open but it can be everything positive so you can say it this way too if you're trying to you know write it in set builder notation you would say all the x's that are an element of the real numbers such that x is greater than zero it can't be zero, and it sure as heck can't be negative. And the graph of that looks like this. Or you can see that we have at x equals zero, we have sort of the vertical asymptote running here. Nothing can be over here, and nothing can be down here. All right, we'll get to those a little bit later, but, and this thing sort of just resides in quadrant one and it kind of just sort of the range hugs zero as well but for this video let's just talk about domain so this is the basics one the basic one right there number one right here this is again a scenario where we're looking to find the domain so let's look at this thing all right this has to be it has to be uh, a positive number it can't be zero and it can't be negative so let's just take that radicand and sort of set it up into this inequality, right? It, those values have to be positive. So if we solve this, we get all the x values that are bigger than two, and that would be our domain. Can't be two, so we leave it parenthesis. If we were able to have two, you would close it, but we can't, so we leave it open. And again, if you wanted to write it this way, you can. all the x values that are greater than two. And you can sort of test one or two. You know, if you put in one in the denominator, three times one minus six, well, that gives you negative three. That does not reside in our real system. That'll give you an imaginary number. And we're not working with those. We're in the real system for this video. And if you plugged in, you know, a number that is bigger than uh, three, excuse me, bigger than two. So if you plugged in three, three times three is nine, nine minus six, so square root of three, that would be seven over the square root of three. That's possible, we can do that. If you plugged in exactly two, three times two is six, so you get the square root of six minus six, which is the square root of zero. You can do the square root of zero, but that leaves you with seven divided by zero, and you can't do that. So that's why zero is not allowed either. And the graph of this looks like this. All right, we said that everything that's bigger than two. So everything to the right of that vertical line. 
x equals 2. Number 2. It's a cube root. So different rules kind of apply here. For a cube root, you know, if you if you took the cube root of let's say, you know, 8, that would be 2. Because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So that's how cube roots work. But the cool part about odd indices or odd roots, whether it's a fifth root or a seventh root, is you can also, I think, take this. So this question, the cube root of negative one, is asking what number multiplies by itself three times to get negative one? And that answer is, of course, negative one, because negative one times negative one is positive one. And then multiply it by negative one again, and we get negative one. Similarly, if we took you know the cube root of negative eight, that gives us negative two, because negative two times negative two times negative two, well this is positive four times negative two is negative eight. So cube root, you're allowed to have uh, negative domain values, but we still have a gigantic restriction because it's in the denominator. Since it's in the denominator, this thing cannot be zero. Everything else is fine, a positive number is fine, a negative number is fine, it just can't be zero. And in set builder notation, x is an element of the reals, it just can't be zero. Cool. The graph of this one looks as you might expect. Right, we've got a vertical asymptote at zero. Everything else is fine. All the negatives are okay. All the positives are okay. <clears throat> Three. So here we have, let's see, a negative. We can kind of rewrite this maybe if you want to do that. Negative one fourth. Uh, if you bring that out, you know, you still have, I guess, square root of x plus 3 on the bottom, so maybe I won't even do that. That was not such a good idea, sorry. But anyway, in any event, we have a square root in the denominator. And that means that, of course, that thing cannot be 0. And in this case, it cannot, the, the radicand, which I, when I say that, I mean the thing underneath, in fact, it has to be positive. So it can't be zero and it can't be negative. You're not allowed to do that. So all we do is we just say, all right, x plus three has to be positive. So x must be bigger than negative three. And we can check that, right? If we plug in a number that is bigger than negative three, let's say negative two, we would get one over four times the square root of negative two plus three. So that's one over, this is negative, negative four, times the square root of one. That would just be negative one fourth. If you wanted to test a number that is smaller than negative three, let's go up here, negative four times the quantity, or times the uh, square root rather of negative five plus three, test it. Uh, negative five plus three is negative two, and you can't take a, uh, you can't take the square root of a negative in the real number system. Same thing would happen if you literally plug 3 in directly. You get the square root of 0, which is fine, but you can't have 0 in the denominator. And if you had negative 3 in there, it would be negative 4 times 0 in the denominator. You can't have that. So your domain for this one is, is uh, everything that is greater than negative 3. So it'd be negative three to infinity. All the real numbers such that x is bigger than negative three. And you can see the graph here too. Negative three is a barrier. Everything to the right of that is fine. <clears throat> and that's negative, it's down here and below the x-axis because of the number in front was negative negative one-fourth. All right, here we go, number four. Now we have sort of a strange thing. In my other video where I did domain and range of 
radical functions. I didn't touch on this one, and that was my mistake. But you can <clears throat> technically you can have the uh, before we get to that one. Technically, you can have you know obviously the square root function looks like this. All right, this is the parent function, but technically you can have negative x underneath because if you plugged in you know negative nine for example f of negative nine is the square root of negative negative nine which is the square root of positive nine which is three so negative nine comma three is a point so if you have if your radicand is negated then it basically takes the parent root function square root function and just sort of reflects it across this y-axis, just kind of flips it this way. Now, if we get back to the root, uh, the rational sort of root version of that, you know, again, we have to think about this as it's you're not allowed to have uh, that thing be a zero, and in the end, you cannot have uh, the radicand underneath when it's all said and done. The radicand cannot be negative. So we just do the same thing. Negative x, negative x must be positive, right? It can't be negative, and it also cannot be zero because if it were zero, the denominator would be zero, and that's not allowed. So negative x is greater than zero, it must be. Well, solve it. Divide by negative one, and you get, you have to flip that the direction of the symbol when you divide by a negative. So all the x's that are less than zero. So the domain of this is negative infinity to zero or you can write it like this all the real numbers such that x is negative you can check that right if you plug in like negative seven it's one over the square root of negative negative seven which is one over the square root of seven which is fine if you plugged in a positive number let's say positive three it's one over the square root of negative three can't have a negative square root in the real system. So it's every negative x value. You can see the graph right there as well. So that wraps this up. You know, four quick examples there on how to determine the domain of functions that look like this, you know, whatever you want to call them. I call them rational root functions, I guess. But just functions that have square roots or cube roots or any sort of radical in the denominator. So I hope this helped you and uh, <clears throat> be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any videos. Thanks for watching.